I suspect that the reason why electric vehicles and battery technology is pushed is to centralize energy generation, to centralize power so that they can shut people down and deprive them of electrical power at any given time. And what I'm seeking to do is completely obviate that entire system in the grid system by decentralizing the turbines that are powering the grid right and allowing people to have their own power plants for them to produce their own electricity reliably and affordably and at a cost a fraction of that of the grid and so now we can take these engines drop them under the hoods of cars and trucks get upwards of 200 plus miles per gallon possibly even more mm -hmm. and then what we can do is couple these to switch reluctance motor generators and then we have onboard electric uh, regenerative braking and electric power assisted takeoff and what's best is that these engines do not need a coolant system which increases their reliability by 60 percent just doing that alone and so now we can have the front grill of the vehicle be a cover plate that's uh, hiding or, or protecting a power wall so you flip it down and now you have dozens of various electrical sockets to plug, plug things into, including buildings. And so now everywhere you go, you have upwards of a one half to one megawatt generator, which having utility class megawatt power at your fingertips anytime you like, now allows people to run cyclotrons and neutron refinement systems, right? Neutron absorbers. Now people can run, you know, commercial class scientific experiments in their basement. They can produce their own <laughs> medical isotopes, can do all sorts of things and nobody can stop them. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, for more information, uh, just visit Pasnia, P A Z N I A dot com. Uh, again, that website is P A Z N I A dot com if you'd like to learn all about uh, the Second Realm Network that we're building. So, on the 200, 200th episode of this podcast, uh, one of the panel members uh, was a fellow Pasnian, uh, John Gear. Uh, therein, John provided a little information um, into some stuff that he'd been working on um, and a project he's, he's uh, uh, his boss, Sky Huddleston. Uh, well, today I'm pleased to welcome Sky onto the Vanu podcast. Uh, Sky is the proprietor over at rocketmassheater.com, uh, where uh, he offers a Liberator rocket heater, very aptly named for this podcast. I like it. Uh, he's an he's a, uh, working on an improved Bork engine, and uh, as I found out in a for lack of a better way to put it, a guest appearance on a Twitch speed dating stream a couple months, a few months back. Uh, he's quite brilliant and uh, is extremely, extremely well studied on uh, a lot of things I've been digging into over the past couple of years, uh, namely ancient civilizations and technologies, and uh, you know this, uh, and the origins and evolutions of humanity, and uh, what happens when our soul leaves the body associated with this incarnation. Uh, to name out a few massive subjects, uh, we probably won't get into most of those today. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I think we'll probably stick to kind of the decentralized independent energy um, that is uh, indeed coming. So today I figure, uh, yeah, we'll dig into his path here, um, you know, some stuff he's working on. Um, and then uh, we'll get into some more overarching subjects, uh, such as the prospects for, again, free independent energy. So, uh, Sky, uh, welcome to the Avani podcast, my friend. How are you today? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing quite well. Awesome to hear. Awesome to hear. So I guess uh, um, for those who may not be familiar with you or your, or your background, I guess, could you start with uh, a little bit a little bit of background on uh, who you are and uh, what you do? So <clears throat> what my company does and the reason why I founded it ultimately was to decentralize energy production and generation systems. I've always grown up uh, under my father. Right. And we always you know, like to be prepared. We like to be able to weather a storm, so to speak. And so one of the things that we were looking at doing was buying a wood stove. And any time we make a major purchase, we do a little bit of investigation research, find out what the best deal is, things of that nature. And we stumbled upon this technology called rocket stoves that was developed by um, Dr. Larry Winyarski and, um, and Ianto Evans back in the 1980s. And nobody had ever actually made any efforts to seriously commercialize the technology there were not there was nothing on the market uh available it was 
even tangentially related to rocket stove technology. So my father and I, we bought a welder, we made one, and we seen how it worked, and it worked out really, really good. So we made small ones when I was about 16 years old. We made small versions for camping, outdoor cooking, and things of that nature. And it sold fairly well for a couple of years. And then we decided to build a, a bigger one for indoor use, residential use, and that worked really good. And so I decided to go ahead and do, you know, drop out of my first semester of college and just do that as a business, as an alternative to um, going to college for mechanical engineering. I said, you know, to heck with it. I could do this on my own merits. I don't need a college degree. And thus far, I think it's worked out better overall than going to college, but regardless. So yeah, that was the objective of that project was to commercialize rocket stove technology, get it tested to UL standards, get it EPA approved. And we actually just got our test reports back a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And we have the third cleanest burning wood stove on, on the market ever built and is wow. barely right behind a catalytic stove and a, a an electric fed pellet stove, which our heater is solid state, non-catalytic and has no moving parts. And it is just barely behind it, so it's within the margin of error. So we have the one of the cleanest burning heaters ever made. And in fact, our combustion efficiency is 99.5%, which is one and a half percent higher than the Methalox burning Raptor engine used by SpaceX. So I'm very happy with these performance results as far as the heaters are concerned. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's definitely that's definitely incredible. And uh, we'll be we'll be building a, a new house here this year uh, at Pasnia, and uh, we definitely do plan on making a Liberator rocket heater. Um, you know, a core part of the uh, the basement there. Um, we're already planning it into the into the design. Um, I don't. Yeah, I, I looked at the website, and yeah, it looks uh, looks absolutely incredible. And uh, so, so yeah, I guess. Uh, um, and, and how old are you, Sky? If you don't mind me asking. Oh, uh, I'm 27. 27. Wow. Okay. Um, so yeah, you're you're younger than me. Um, so I guess um, I, I mentioned before. Um, I guess in the introduction that you that I heard I heard you on that uh, on that Twitch stream, and you, you covered a lot of uh, really deep topics. You know, ancient, ancient civilizations and technologies. Um, you you, you kind of gave your, your path to, to the Liberator rocket stove. Could you, um, I guess, tell us a little bit about what got you interested in some of those more overarching subjects? So I had a, a plethora of mentors throughout, you know, my, my early career. And I'm not going to name this particular person, but he was a very, is a very, very intelligent person. And I'm, I'm very lucky to have him as a personal friend and acquaintance. And he really opened my eyes to a lot of the, uh, the objective truths and the metrological data regarding a lot of the ancient antediluvian masonry structures and their patterns. How should I put this? They have identical methodologies of construction throughout the world that we don't even see today that would be exceptionally difficult to reproduce even with modern technology. Take, for example, the large H blocks at Puma Punku, which is within the Tiwanaku archaeological site. And these stones, a lot of these stones have very precise rectilinear grooves cut in them that are perfectly parallel, square, and perpendicular to the faces of the blocks themselves and have approximately six millimeter holes um, drilled equidistantly spaced at the bottoms of these recessed grooves and making a six millimeter hole approximately a foot deep inside solid stone and having no deviation walk or wobble in stone is something that would be exceptionally difficult to do even today. Right. Right. Yeah, that's... I uh, mean, there's, there's a lot more to these ancient structures. There's a lot more to these ancient structures than just that. They're they're perfectly fitted, right? And, and not just rectilinear. They a lot of these structures are polygonal in shape. So it's almost as though they were sculpted or, or put into a clay or plastic like consistency and then stacked atop each other, right? And then they're so so fitted. It's hard to describe without photographs, right? But uh, imagine taking clay blocks and turning them into various random polygonal shapes and then stacking them in such a way that they form perfect uh, joinery across the entire mating faces. Uh, and these stones are, you know, three to four feet thick, right? And equally large side to side and wide and tall. So these are very, very heavy rocks, many, many, many dozens of tons each in many cases. 
and they are perfectly fitted, which again, we can't even do that with today's technology and not in bluestone granite, which is what a lot of these structures are made out of is, is limestone and bluestone granite. Another case would be um, the casing stones of the pyramids, uh, specifically the Giza Plateau. Dr. Joseph Davidovitz, who is a world-renowned French material scientist and researcher, he subjected the casing stones to X-ray scattering spectroscopy, and he found f carbon fibrous inclusions and entrained air bubbles in the limestone, which does not exist in natural limestone. And he was able to use electron microscopy to ascertain that these stones contain a high concentration of natron salts, far higher than what we would ever see in natural limestone. And through this information, he was able to back engineer the, the uh, reagglomeration, this geopolymer formula that was used to build the casing stones of the pyramids. And he was actually able to slip cast and pour his own 12 ton megalithic block structures that are again, perfectly fitted without any mortar and perfectly conjoined along the seams. So it just makes sense. If you pour in a, a reagglomerated limestone, right? And then it re-cures into a solid limestone, you can pour blocks on top of blocks and achieve the, per, uh, the perfect fitment that we see in a lot of these structures. Now the geopolymer theory doesn't explain all of the structures such as the bluestone granite at Saxahoyamon and Olente Tambo. However, it does explain the Giza Plateau's perfect fitment and they're uh, specifically regarding to the outer casing stones. And now that we have this formula, we could actually build our roads and structures using solid poured reagglomerated limestone, which is considerably stronger than Portland cement and much more environmentally friendly. So if anybody's out there looking for a business plan or idea, that's one that I don't have time to pursue. So you go for it, please. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. And and yeah, I mean, looking into, uh, yeah, you know, ancient civilizations and, and, some, and yeah, kind of what you're talking about, the technology. I kind of had this conception growing up, and obviously it was program servile society. I think you'd call it modernity, but um, it's, it's, it's a program servile society, you know, belief that, you know, there's this linear progression of humanity. And uh, you look at things like that, um, which you've laid out, and, you know, the pyramids and, and their, you know, um, you know, their, uh, you know, astronomological alignments and all of that that we can't replicate today. Uh, we know a lot of us don't have, a lot of people don't have that knowledge. Most people don't have that knowledge today. So, um, yeah, I guess w would you sit, would you agree with that that you know there's n it's not necessarily a linear progression of humanity that they that there were you know more um, you know more advanced civilizations that had uh, you know decentralized energy and uh, yeah as you're saying these 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 other construction techniques that we we can't even really replicate at this point. Oh yeah, absolutely right. So one of the interesting things about the my so I don't know if you guys are familiar with the whole metric versus SAE or mile system debate. So in the, during the, after the French revolution, they decided to eschew the um, imperial system of units of measure, right? Or so-called imperial at the time. And instead the French created the metric system. Well, there's actually a problem with the metric system and that it is predicated upon a, um, a, a, a non-empirical unit, i.e. the meter, and the meter is a very irrational decision, right? So it used to be, right, that there was a bar of platinum, and this was the meter. And this bar of platinum, which was cut at, you know, a certain length, that was the meter, and then they changed it to basing the meter off of the uh, Earth's diameter divided by a specific number, and I forget what that number was, and now it's the speed of light divided by a you know, almost a rational number, right? Mm -hmm. But he, here's the interesting thing, right? <clears throat> How should I put this? The stone, so the mile system, right, which is what the U.S. uses, the mile system is actually predicated upon, right, the U.S. system is predicated upon the English system, which is predicated upon the Roman units of measurements, which are predicated upon the Greek units of measurements, which are predicated upon the Sumerian, the Babylonian and Sumerian units of measurements. And do you know where the Sumerians in their own in their own texts state that they received their units of measurements? Where? From, quote, the old ones, whatever that means. Now, here's where this gets interesting. The sun is exactly 864,000 miles in diameter, 
which is precisely the 10 times the number of seconds in a day, right? <clears throat> And then the Earth's rotational velocity is exactly six, 66,600 miles per hour, and the Moon's radius is 1,080 miles, and 108 times 10 is considered to be the most sacred number of the Vedas, and the pyramid encodes the exact dimensions of the Earth, including its diameter and its rotational velocity and its distal relationship to the Moon. And the Parthenon is precisely one arc second in width at its latitude in Athens. So they had, whoever created this unit of measurement system was able to determine the diameter of the sun. <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, that's, that's definitely incredible. Um, <clears throat> yeah, mind blowing. Don't, don't really know where to go, um, where to go from that one. But, but yeah, I mean, that's, that, it's, it's crazy to, it's crazy to think about. Um, it's definitely crazy to think about. So I guess what, since we're, we're kind of on this subject, um, what would, I, I, I heard you mention, um, again, that, uh, that Twitch stream that, uh, you know, like there's different, uh, you know, there's different ancient te technological trees. Um, could you speak to a little bit more to the, the various, I guess, technologies that you've come across that, that you've found uh, that from ancient civilizations that you've taken an interest in, whether just, you know, hypothetically or theoretically or whatever? Well, all that we really have hard in, t in terms of hard evidence for is the masonry structures. And one of the interesting things is that they were able to develop the, these masonry technologies that vastly deviate from our own technology. And when we ask ourselves, well, well, how could they have done this, right? Well, a lot of people say, well, were you saying that they were more advanced than current civilization, right? Well, yes and no. So our civilization, uh, our contemporary civilization's technology is predicated upon uh, chemistry, which evolved from alchemy, and the petrochemistry, petrochemical industry very specifically. That's where most of our technological prowess is predicated upon is the petrochemical in industry. So, right, being able to melt and smelt metals using coal and carbon and oils, right, being able to produce plastics and semiconductors and draw thin wires. You know, all of this is predicated upon petrochemical industry, right? That goes way back into the 19th century. But what if instead you had a, tech, a civilization that had discovered uh, electricity before chemistry, right? What, what different things, how would they approach solutions, technology and development differently, right? We can look at the transition from vacuum tubes to transistors, right? And so when vacuum tubes were issued for transistors, we never actually solved exactly how vacuum tubes work. They're still an enigma scientifically, right? So what if we, we can't even know where vacuum tubes would have taken us if we had continued down that path? And so this is the thing that I'd like to emphasize here is that when a technology is discovered and developed, right, it becomes institutionalized and a lot of industry inertia gets built up behind it. And so that just becomes a lot of the de facto solutions to problems uh, technologically and otherwise that people have. And so the incentive to investigate another potential solution predicated upon a wholly different technology is completely obviated because the solution to any civilization or people in front of them is obvious. They just grab the drill to create the hole, right? Now, who would ever think, right, which the drill, of course, is produced, you know, using centered metals and, and you know, heat treated with eddy carbide inclusions, right? But why would we ever investigate another alternative solution when we can pick up a drill right from Home Depot for 60 bucks when there might be a better solution predicated upon a completely different technology, but it would require it would require a, a, a discovery of a completely different technology. Who would ever investigate that when they could just buy the drill? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Good points. Good points for sure. Um, and, and I guess that that leads us into um, in, into to this area, um, you know, like I, I I'm not sure if you uh, have you come across any, I guess, uh, any previous civilizations that had, you know, so-called, you know, decentralized free energy. Um, and, and I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and get into that now. What, what are your some of your what are your some of your prospects for for that for that realm uh, in, in the coming years? Uh, is is well, independent energy coming? Infinite energy. I don't. Independent I'm energy. very reserved. But yeah. 
yeah, decentralization of energy generation, that's that's very solid, right? So um, the internal combustion engine hasn't really made any advancements since the 1890s, not really, right? Other than, you know, controlling mass airflow and a little bit more sophisticated methodologies of, of control. But, you know, Honda, you know, was very, very proud about their overhead cam engine, which marginally increases volumetric efficiency when they debuted that in their sedans in the 90s. Well, that's not really an advancement. Overhead cam engines were very common and prolific in the 1890s. Now, granted, they took on a slightly different morphology and that the cam was external to the engine. The point stands nonetheless that overhead cams are old, not new. And a lot of the technolo technology that we see being debuted and rolled out today is just old technology that's rebranded. For example, a new technology that I only recently learned of is steel anodizing. So about a decade ago, a little less than a, a company, and I forget the company's name, invented steel anodizing and tried to patent it and commercialize it. And when they went to patent it, well, guess what? Turns out it was already patented in the 1890s and nobody had ever bothered to commercialize it. And this is what we see in a lot of technology and a lot of advancements is that new technology is actually just old technology that's been rediscovered or rebranded. Mm -hmm. And then when, when we bring up that it's old technology, people say, well, if it was so great, it would be everywhere by now, which isn't true. In fact, it's very seldom true. Acadie's Power, which has an opposed piston engine design, all they did was take an old aircraft engine from the 1930s and modernize it. And now their company is worth like $35 million or something. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, when, I, when I try to take an old technology, at least in my personal experience, and commercialize it, People just say, well, if it was so great, it would be everywhere by now, which just isn't true. This, this patent was false. Mm -hmm. It took the transistor 40 years from its inception to reach commercialization and adoption. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Um, so I guess what uh, um, I've, I've come across, uh, and that's, that's what the interesting part with this is that when I started looking into solutions for, you know, independent or, you know, decentralized energy, um, it wasn't just that there's like one or two options. It's, I just kept coming across additional ones. Um, I, I came across a guy named uh, Walter Russell, uh, who in the 1960s um, came up with, I guess, using vortexes and, ma and magnets. I don't, I don't understand it completely, but he powered a 52-room university um, with just that um, back in the 60s and then donated the, the, the uh, technology to the U.S. government. Um, because he thought it was, uh, you know, like it could, it could revolutionize, change, change the world, and obviously it was never seen again. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's Walter Russell, there's Zero Point Energy, which is talked about a lot. So, you know, there's, there's the improved Bork engine. Um, there's a site that sells, you know, assembled magnetic motors, which I, 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 I see um, just from my basic understanding, I see a lot of pros promise with, with magnetic motors as, as a form of uh, independent energy. Um, but uh, and then there's obviously the kind of the more... The, the, Are we back? Okay, yeah, we, had, we there was a technical glitch for some reason. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, no problem at all. So we're, we got it back going. So as uh, all that matters. Um, so yeah, I was I was mentioning uh, the various some of the various um, free energy or I guess independent energy solutions I've come across, um, and I was just going to mention uh, the last one being you know the the ones that you know Nikola Tesla is um, you know uh, credited with a lot of these sorts of innovations. So from um, from what you've looked into, as as far as uh, promising prospects um, in this realm, what what uh, is, are there any technologies that really, really uh, that you're really, really interested in? Well, I mean, the ones that are most promising for me, given my specific specialization of knowledge and what is within my wheelhouse and what I can speak to with confidence, mm -hmm. is in pulse detonation technology. So, in the 1950s and 60s, Chapman Juga and Fickett Jacobs. Right, Fickett and Jacobs worked out the Fickett Jacobs cycle based off of the Chapman Jugat mathematical theorems and algorithms. And what they discovered is that pure isochoric heat addition is inherently more efficient, all other factors being equal, than partial isobaric, isochoric, or isobaric heat addition. And so, this what this means is that the auto cycle thermodynamically is actually more efficient than the diesel cycle. But the only reason why our diesel engines get more miles per gallon than the auto cycle engines is because they can run much higher compression ratios than conventional auto cycle engines. So they become more efficient overall, even though their thermal, uh, their thermal efficiency is much lower than the auto cycle engines. And they also burn heavy liquids, which is why, largely why they're isobaric is because their flame forms propagate very slowly. 
And so what this really showed to me is that conventional engines, and it has been long been assumed by academia and so forth, that if you try to detonate the fuel in a conventional engine, it will break, which is true. However, there are engines out there, engine designs, that do detonate the fuel. And in fact, when it comes to open cycle engines, the U.S. Air Force has spent billions of dollars trying to create a pulse detonation, a rotating detonation wave engine. And that's because they know that isochloric heat addition is inherently more efficient and more powerful than isobaric heat addition. And what's very interesting is that it is exceptionally difficult to achieve pulse detonation in an open cycle engine for thrust, which is what the Air Force is going for. But it is exceptionally easy to achieve detonation in a closed cycle engine such as a piston or rotary engine for shaft horsepower. So easy is it, in fact, that we have to put in octane additives to increase the octane rating to prevent detonation of the fuel in the engine because it will break conventional engines, which I find to be pretty backwards are engines that are very easy to detonate fuel. We assume we don't want detonation. In the open cycle engines, where it is exceptionally difficult to achieve reliable pulse detonation, we're spending billions of dollars trying to achieve. I think that's very backwards. We should just build a piston engine deliberately designed to detonate the fuel to achieve a, a pure Fickett Jacobs constant volume pulse detonation cycle, which by the way, the Fickett Jacobs cycle is more thermodynamically efficient than the Brayton cycle, which is more efficient than the Rankine cycle, which is used in most power generation plants that are in vogue today, which is more efficient yet still than the auto and diesel cycle respectively. So we can achieve an efficiency that is leaps about and bounds ahead of what even the large institutionalized gas turbines that power our grid today. We can achieve a higher efficiency and a much smaller package with much simpler components and a higher degree of reliability in a way that decentralizes energy generation. And so now, instead of having to buy electricity, which is 10 cents per kilowatt hour on average, and by the way, electricity is one of the most expensive forms of energy money can buy. Uh, e even gasoline per BTU is cheaper than electricity. It's just that our engines are so horrendously inefficient that it becomes more expensive to run a gas engine than it is to buy electricity from the grid. But now, once these engines are developed and commercialized, now it's actually cheaper to produce your own power using natural gas, gasoline, diesel, etc., than it is to buy electricity from the grid. And so this will force the grid to actually adopt nuclear power generation to stay solvent. Interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. And I guess the, the overarching thing that comes to mind for me, and I'm not sure what your, I guess, uh, your so-called politics are or whatever, what's your, your view on, on government and, and what I call the servile society is. But, um, I mean, you look at, like, uh, um, the super inefficient, you know, like 20, 25 miles per gallon vehicles. I, um, and, and you look at, yeah, again, just the inefficiencies, inefficiencies all around. And then you have, uh, you know, the, the, the constant propaganda about climate change and how, uh, it, but even though we're using the most inefficient technology, right? Um, so it's, 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 I it's, would like to point mm -hmm. out, I would like to point out that the Model T, I want you to guess how many miles per gallon the Model T achieved. How many miles per gallon did the Model T achieve? Probably 25 miles. I, I don't know, 20, 25. Probably, probably, probably about the it, same. It averaged between it averaged between 19 and 21 miles per gallon, and this vehicle was designed in 1906. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's so. And I also came across a guy named George Wiseman who just for. Um, for it's a it's a he used to sell the kit pretty cheaply on his site but it's just a, a carburetor upgrade and uh, he could take just just for a super small pittance it's like take a 20 20 20 mile per hour, 20 mile per gallon vehicle up to like 200 miles per gallon um so like it's just everything is everything is such a scam um at least it's that's been my um my experience but i don't, I don't know if you have anything to add there I, I, i've read I've read George Wiseman's books, and his books is a large contributing factor that got me interested in this technology. Oh, cool. And his 200 mile per gallon, it was a um, 1960s GMC truck, if I recall correctly, from the book. And he was able to achieve, yes, 200 MPG using a conventional 292 straight six, if I recall correctly. However, it was an exceptionally complex design that would be prone to explosion if ever there was an accident or failure of the materials or etc. However, I do know how he achieved it, and he achieved it through thermal catalytic cracking and, he, and adiabatic heat reclamation, and I figured out a way to do that in a much safer way 
that's much more reliable, much more consistent, and doesn't require active monitoring and adjustment because it phase changes the material into a supercritical fluid, which allows us to, to then drop the fluid, drop the um, pressure into a pressure reducing regulator and vapor accumulation tank, which is set as a specific pressure such as 150 PSI or whatever we want to use for any mission profile. And so now we have a consistent fuel. And what this means is that we can put any combustible liquid into the tank, including a mixture of combustible fluids, such as gasoline, diesel, crude oil directly from the driller, waste motor oil, waste vegetable oil, coal water slurries, charcoal water slurries, uh, waste ketones and waste paints and thinners, waste you know, brake fluids, you name it. Any combustible fluid goes into the tank and a consistent product of hydrogen and carbon monoxide, specifically monatomic hydrogen, which is far more efficient at combustion than double bonded hydrogen. And that goes into the vapor accumulation tank, which then is fed into the intake plenum. And so now you have a true multi-fuel engine that does not require any adjustment irrespective of what fuel or mixture of fuels you're using. Incredible, yeah, and I'm glad I'm glad you brought it up because that that was uh, I guess another angle. I'd been I I guess I I learned about uh, um, what St Stanley Myers hydrogen car, and then I, I and then yeah that you're talking about monoatomics, um, monoatomic hydrogen. Um, is that would that be the, would that be the same thing as the electrically expanded um, electrically electrically expanded water um, being used for fuel? Is that kind of the same concept? You're just I guess changing well, the input. It could be, it could be. A lot of Stanley Myers technology has been shrouded in mystery and myth and a lot of it has been lost after his unfortunate death but what we do know is that when monatomic hydrogen burns it releases far more energy than standard double bonded hydrogen gas and there is a very specific reason for this and the reason is that hydrogen in its natural state hydrogen gas bonds to itself so you'll have two hydrogen atoms that are that are double bonded to each other and it takes energy to crack these two hydrogen atoms apart before they can bond with oxygen and release more exothermic energy right but if we can use catalysts and high temperatures and super and pressures to create a supercritical fluid and break this double bond apart into a monatomic hydrogen gas where the hydrogen atoms exist uh, independently of each other. Now we can release far more energy because we're not wasting the energy to break the double bond of hydrogen gas apart before burning it, which the same is true, by the way, of all hydrocarbons. It takes energy to break the carbon-nitrogen bond, bond, the carbon-hydrogen bond, and the carbon-carbon bonds. And so by phase changing the fluids into a supercritical fluid and then cracking these bonds apart using reclaimed waste heat and catalysts to reduce the amount of energy that is required to break these bonds. So typically in a normal engine, when you inject the fuel, the fuel has to vaporize, which vaporization, just like how sweating cools your body down, when the fuels vaporize, which they have to vaporize before they can crack the, the bonds, that robs energy from the engine, right? Because when you vaporize the fuel, it phase changes into a gas, which sucks up energy. And then you have to break the bonds apart using heat, which pure thermal cracking requires far more energy than catalytic cracking. And so now that robs even more heat. And then after everything is broken apart, now all the carbon and hydrogen can finally bond with oxygen and release its exothermic energy. But all those reactions before preceding that were endothermic and heat robbing. And so by using waste heat from the exhaust and catalysts to reduce the amount of energy required to crack these bonds, we can greatly increase the effective energy density of liquid hydrocarbon based fuels by potentially exponential amounts. And so now that we've re increased the amount of energy that's extractable from these liquid fuels by upwards of 50 to 100%, possibly even more. Now, <coughs> sorry about that. Now, not only have we increased the energy density immensely, we've also increased the, the efficiency and the energy extracted from these fuels for the given amount of fuel by several standard deviations. And this also is what offers it the multi-fuel capability. So, yeah, this is a very promising technology. You know, if it, I, I want to emphasize this. The lithium-ion battery has an energy density of, at best, one megajoule per kilogram. Diesel fuel 
is about 35 to 40 megajoules per kilogram, depending on variables, and gasoline is about 38 to 45 megajoules per kilogram, again, depending on variables, octane rating, etc. A ham sandwich is 20 megajoules per kilogram, and wood is about 17 megajoules per kilogram. So wood contains 1,700% more energy by weight than a fully charged lithium ion battery. If we can increase the energy density or the energy extractable from liquid hydrocarbons, right? So these, the energy densities are determined by burning these things in a calorimeter, which is a basically an insulated box where you measure the temperature before inside the box before and after the reaction, the chemical reaction is complete. Well, the problem with burning things like diesel fuel and gasoline in a calorimeter is that all these endothermic reactions that precede exothermic oxidation um, occur without catalysis, and catalysts reduce the amount of energy required to crack these bombs. And so by introducing a catalytic system, a catalytic fuel reformation system into the um, into the equation, now we can actually increase the energy extracted and the energy density of the fuels and the calorimeter. So now liquid hydrocarbons could have upwards of 60 plus megajoules per kilogram. If we increase the energy density of a lithium ion battery from one to one and a half megajoules per kilogram, i.e. increasing it by, you know, 50%, that would be big news across the world. And that is going from one to one and a half megajoules per kilogram. In this situation, we're going from 40 to 60 megajoules per kilogram. Leaps and bounds ahead of what would otherwise make global news if it was in battery technology. And I suspect that the reason why electric vehicles and battery technology is pushed is to centralize energy generation, to centralize power so that they can shut people down and deprive them of electrical power at any given time. And what I'm seeking to do is completely obviate that entire system in the grid system by decentralizing the turbines that are powering the grid right, and allowing people to have their own power plants for them to produce their own electricity reliably and affordably and at a cost of fraction that of the grid. And so now we can take these engines, drop them under the hoods of cars and trucks, get upwards of 200 plus miles per gallon, possibly even more. Mm -hmm. And then what we can do is couple these to switch reluctance motor generators. And then we have onboard electric uh, regenerative braking and electric power assisted takeoff. And what's best is that these engines do not need a coolant system, which increases their reliability by 60% just doing that alone. And so now we can have the front grill of the vehicle be a cover plate that's uh, hiding or, or protecting a power wall. So you flip it down and now you have dozens of various electrical sockets to plug, plug things into, including buildings. And so now everywhere you go, you have upwards of a one half to one megawatt generator which having utility class megawatt power at your fingertips anytime you like now allows people to run cyclotrons and neutron refinement systems, right? Neutron absorbers. Now people can run, you know, commercial class scientific experiments in their basement. They can produce their own <laughs> medical isotopes. They can do all sorts of things and nobody can stop them. Hell yeah. I love it, man. I, I absolutely love it. Um, and I guess the, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, so, so Vani was about, you know, uh, and I'll mention this for your benefits, Sky, Vani was about building, you know, resilient, liberated lifestyles. And uh, one of those popular ones, or one of the, one of the common themes uh, with Vani was mobility. Um, so there are a lot of van nomads out there. Um, so the, the van nomads drop the biggest expense, which is usually housing. And uh, then their biggest expense becomes gas and, and fuel and energy. Well, um, it sounds like, uh, you know, imagine being a van nomad not having any, you know, upfront, like any costs, on, like hardly any costs on, uh, on fuel. Um, I think that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty incredible. And uh, um, I, let, let me put it like this. With the thermal catalytic cracking system that I'm developing, you would be able to make charcoal anywhere in the woods, which charcoal is trivial to make, mix it with water at a, whatever ratio you desire, typically the thicker the better, unless it's a very cold environment, right? But regardless, you can make synthetic bunker fuel by mixing charcoal dust and water, and this engine will run it as though it were diesel. <laughs> wow. That's that's incredible. Um, yeah, that's 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 definitely incredible. And I, I guess you kind of provided your thoughts on it a little bit, but I'm just curious with your extensive knowledge in this in this area. Um, 
Yeah, to, to me, that was my initial thing is, well, you're dependent on batteries for a lot of this stuff. But, like, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, the, the, the alternative energy solutions being pushed by the Servile Society? Um, you know, will they maybe, you know, improvements? We're not getting anywhere near the efficiency or the improvements that you're talking about. So, like, what are your thoughts on geothermal and solar and some of these other alternatives that are, you know, very, very pushed and, and even subsidized by the state? Well, I, I want you to know how all of these energy systems require and, and are subsidized by the government because they push for centralization. True. Yeah. Right. So solar, solar is only tenable in desert environments and environments where there's a lot of reliable sunlight, and it still requires large, expensive energy storage and distribution systems, mm -hmm. and so it centralizes power and control of electrical generation geothermal, all these things require large scales of, and centralization so that they can shut you down at any time. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're trying to take away people's engines is because it's the only thing standing between them and total control of power, literal power. Right. Well said. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you with you on uh, on all of that. And uh, you mentioned, yeah, so y you've got a lot of knowledge in this area. So I, I just want to bring up or I just want to ask about about this. I've, I found a guy on YouTube that um, it did like monoatomic gold experiments where, you know, he basically had a jar full of, I guess, salt water and then um, a positive negative or I guess would it be an anode and a cathode. And you can literally create, you know, these monoatomics from, you know, from from that solution. So I guess could you speak a little bit um, since it sounds like you have some knowledge on this, um, like uh, um, whether for, you know, the monoatomic gold and like, you know, the health supplement uh, variety or um, I guess uh, since we're talking about energy, you know, independence here. Um, how someone could get started just, you know, experimenting with these with with these ideas, you know, in their home or their basement? Uh, well, so monatomic, so I, I'm kind of a, a strange, right? So there are a lot more than four different types of, uh, of states of matter, right? So we're all familiar with solids, liquids, gases, and plasmas, right? But then you have quark, gluon, plasmas, droplets, degenerate matter. You have fermionic condensate, Bose-Einstein condensate, superfluids, time crystals supposedly uh so there are a lot of different um states of matter and i'm of the opinion that supercritical fluids and monatomic uh, elements right monatomic materials are different states of matter because they fit the definition of a different state of matter right they have different physical properties and different chemical properties when in these different states of matter and so as far as monatomic gold is concerned right i'm not a, a medicine guy my knowledge on healing and on biology is cursory at best. However, what I can say is that if you make monatomic metals or metalloids, you are almost certainly going to receive a whole slew of different chemical properties once they are in a pure monatomic state. And what these chemical properties are, I can't speak to because it's outside of my wheelhouse as far as metals are concerned. I haven't done enough research into that. What I do know is that monatomic gases are highly reactive and supercritical fluids are very unique in that they have the plastic properties of liquid, right? So that they're, they're dense and non-compressible like a liquid, but they have free ionic exchanges and they homogenize. So they homogenize like a gas. They have the density of a liquid and they exchange electrons and they are ionized like a plasma. So they have properties of each of these states of matter. So I would consider supercritical fluids to be a different state of matter entirely. Same thing with superfluids, which is if you take a liquid and you sufficiently cool it, assuming it doesn't freeze into a solid, right? So helium is one of these liquids you can do this with, and you sufficiently cool it, you can get a liquid that has a literal zero viscosity index, meaning that it flows with zero frictional losses. Gotcha. Okay, amazing. Um... I, yeah, I, I love it. So yeah, I, I came across the monoatomics realm. Um, John mentioned in the in the 200th episode about potentially being able to generate, uh, you know, monoatomics from salt water. He has he wants to live on a sail, but we want to live on a sail, but at some time too. And uh, you know, generating uh, you know energy and you know, um, I guess uh, commercial operations on the uh, you know and salt water with monoatomics is seems to be a really incredible viable option. And, and yeah, I take a supplement with with mono. It's got like a dozen monoatomics in it. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't know I don't know a whole lot about it. Can't really explain it too well like you did, but um, I, I see a lot of a lot of potential there, um, a lot of potential, and that also ties in with, with George Wiseman again. Um, he basically he converted the technology, the electro, electrical expanded water, um, and the hydrogen water, and he he sells an aqua cure machine. Um, 
which is yeah, um, inhaling Brown's gas essentially. Do you, do you know anything about Brown's gas? It's, it's the same same thing as we're talking about here, right? Yeah, I, I've read a lot of George Wiseman's books. In fact, I was at the ESTC conference um, in last year in July, in 2021 in July, and I met George Wiseman's um, protege, um, and he had one of the Brown's gas generators. The um, it's certainly a very interesting technology. Like I said, this is all bleeding edge research, mm -hmm. and we need to do a lot more investigation and a lot more experimentation into this technology to really see what its applications are and where it can go. For sure, for sure. And I guess just another question that comes to mind is, um, you know, the, the Liberator rocket heater just as you know, a, a method of heating is, is incredible. Um, but uh, um, and I'm, I don't th I'm not sure if this overlines, overlaps with the I don't think it does, but I think it was mentioned. I was talking talking to John about it, maybe someone that he met at that conference too. But, um, you know, putting a Tesla turbine, whatever that is, I don't know what that looks like or entails, but a so-called Tesla turbine onto um, like a rocket heater like that um, and using that to generate, you know, generate power too. Is that is that possible with it being that efficient? So, uh, yes, actually, J John Gear got that from me because that's one of the um, technologies that I want to pursue. I can't go into detail as to how we're going to execute that. But what I can say is that the final end of this morphology is going to be an internal combustion, solid fuel, any fuel burning, gas turbine engine that can turn over a generator. And so now you can, using wood, trash, burn, even plastics cleanly, and you could produce anywhere from 5 to 10 kilowatts of continuous output power using a wood stove with standard wood stove consumption rates of anywhere from 80 to 110,000 BTUs. And so this is a very promising technology for wow. decentralized energy generation. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely definitely sounds like it. Um, definitely sounds like it. I, so, so I mentioned we're 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 going to be uh, you know building a place here, and we're we're gonna look into we've got a we're, we have got a pond we're gonna expand. So we're gonna look into geothermal. Is we're we're kind of taking transitionary steps, um, propane being one of them, and then and possibly solar. Geothermal, geothermal is very good. Geothermal yeah. is very good. Um, solar is good as a backup because mm -hmm. solar is so, solid. So I wouldn't invest a lot of money into solar. I, I, I mean, right, people's budgets are different, right? Budget what you can afford. But what I would do, right, solar is good as a solid state backup, right? So it's good because solar panels are exceptionally reliable and because they are solid state, they are going to provide you anywhere from between 20 and 40 years of power. And so if all of your other systems have an energy failure, you will at least have some power, some time. And what I, so the biggest cost with solar panels really is that they require expensive rare earth elements to produce, right? And these rare earth elements come from monazite sands. And the problem with monazite sands, as far as the mining perspective, is that most monazite sand deposits in the world have high concentrations of thorium that dilute your rare earth element deposits, which is what you really want to go for, right? But once we can commercialize, fifth generation molten salt reactors that can use thorium as a nuclear fuel, now all these monazite sands suddenly become tenable and economical to mine. And so the price of solar panels and, and permanent magnet motor generators as used in wind turbines and high efficiency electric motors will shoot through the floor. And so now it will become just as economical to use solar panels for your roofing as we do steel or asphalt shingles today. And so now all of our roofs can be solar panels and we don't really have to care about how much energy they put out, right? Because they're just as cheap to install as asphalt shingles. Right. And so who, can, who gives a damn? And this is one of the things that when you get into decentralized energy generation, right? And this is one of the unique things about it is that the more energy you have and the more energy power and generation systems you have, the easier it is to make more energy and it compounds upon itself. So nuclear power plants that run on thorium obviously decrease the cost of energy immensely, right? And now the cost of manufacturing solar panels goes so far down because now we have access to all these cheap rare earth elements. And so now it's just as cheap to put up you know, solar panels instead of asphalt shingles for your roofing. And even though you don't need it because we're all you know running on nuclear power, fuck it, why not? It's just as cheap. And so now that makes energy even cheaper, makes energy even cheaper. And so now we can do things like instead of running batteries, which are really expensive, right? 
Now we can run Sabatier reactors in our backyard and just dump our excess energy into, you know, water and carbon dioxide from the air and recombine it back into methane gas and store them in large gasometers, distribute it throughout the natural gas distribution system. And so now gasometers in the natural gas supply lines now become the new de facto battery for energy. And we can have our own personal gasometers coupled with collective gasometers. And so now it has all the benefits of centralized power ge distribution and generation with all the advantages of decentralized power. And so now when it comes to storms and natural disasters, no longer a problem. Everybody has all the energy they need. Incredible. Um, and incredible. So I, I guess would the I would like to emphasize I would like to emphasize mm -hmm. that transporting natural gas via the natural gas supply chain, supply lines, are way more efficient than the electric grid. So the electric grid, you get about a 30% line losses just in the distribution. Natural gas supply distribution is 99.99% efficient. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, so I guess you you, you uh, answered part of my question there. Um, the the I, I guess uh, I, I appreciate the insight on geothermal um, and and also solar. Yeah, solar is not necessarily it's it's not definitely not a primary, but um, we're considering it just because you know yeah you got to put shingles on there and if you put solar on there why not? Um, but but regardless I, I, I and I know time time frames are hard to put on these whether it's whether it's your whether it's your project or or just generally speaking. Um, you know, how long do you think it'll be until um, some of these solutions are more commercially or, you know, more easily available to the point where there's, you know, a tutorial on, on how to, you know, how, how individuals can do these things themselves? Well, I mean, it depends on what specific technology we're talking about. But what I can say with a high degree of confidence is that all of the technologies that I'm working on will be commercially available within a, approximately five years. Awesome. That's, uh, that's possibly sooner. Great. Fantastic, man. That's that's uh, it's really, really incredible to hear. Um, yeah, I, I stumbled across a lot of these topics a few years back. And, I, and when I when I realized, uh, you know, like food's obviously important. But if, uh, you know, we can decentralize ener energy production um, like that's the main that's one of the main sources of control in the survival society right now is uh, yeah, is energy. Um, and uh, and that would be a, a major, a major step in, in the direction of freedom if, um, you know, we call it the passing of the second realm network if. Um, you know, um, these things just like, uh, you know, proliferate everywhere before, uh, you know, those who falsely imagine themselves be, uh, to be our rulers until they, you know, before they know what, what hit them. And, uh, you know, technology is decentralized or, you know, the energy is decentralized. And uh, I think that'd be a really, really, really incredible. And even just on the self-sufficient angle, too. But um, we've been going for, for about an hour here. Um, I want to give you a chance to uh, to talk, uh, or I guess uh, mention anything else about uh, you know the uh, about your 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 uh, current entrepreneurial venture, the uh, the rocket mass heater. Um, it's rocketmassheater.com is the website for that, and I'll put a link in the show notes. But um, is there anything else you want to mention uh, in regards to uh, you know what's uh, um, in regards to that? Uh, no, I just we're we're taking orders right now. There is a huge backlog because of the high demand, but we are taking orders, so. If you're interested in a, you know, wood stove or pellet stove that can burn both pellets and wood with a high degree of efficiency, our website's rocketheater.com or rocketmassheater.com. We have both domains. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's basically it. I appreciate your time. Awesome. Awesome to hear, man. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll have to have to get you back on at some other point. I mean, it w m might uh, might not necessarily be on the free energy topic, but I would like to dig more into it. it's it's something that, something I'm looking into because the more I, the more I study the past and history, the more I learn about like that's how I came across a lot of these free energy topics um, was by you know studying what's been what's been done and known before. So uh, maybe at some point I can get you back on to to dive more into uh, you know I guess uh, looking back uh, um, looking back, but. Uh, Anyway, for now, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, thanks so much for your time, Sky. And uh, um, like I said, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll probably be uh, placing an order for a rocket mass heater here sometime, uh, sometime soon for the, uh, for the, uh, for the new, uh, what we're calling the embassy here, uh, at the Free Republic of Pasadena. So um, anything else, Sky, before I let you go? Nope, thank you very much. Awesome, man. Well, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, all right, guys, and there you have it, uh, Sky Huddleston, uh, rocketmassheater.com. Um, yeah, just a truly, truly an incredible, incredible conversation. And I uh, do hope you enjoyed it and, uh, uh, and found it valuable. Uh, BonuPodcast.com is the website for everything Bonu. And, uh, yeah, as always, um, uh, always remember, uh, Bonu is yours for the making, and the second realm is yours for the building. Uh, cheers. 2048, the second volume in the Brushfire Thriller series. 
takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the war of ideas took place. The creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished through the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the Freedom Cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been band nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They're up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the trio, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the trio pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Under Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Libertarian Tech Publications, share your story, find your freedom.